Where did human consciousness come from? It begins like this. In that foraging phase where we were testing all kinds of plants on the grassland, small amounts of psilocybin mushrooms would have naturally been eaten in the process of eating corms and things like that. I personally have seen baboons uh, in Kenya investigating cow paddies on the savanna uh, because they know that bug uh, pupa will be under the cow paddies. So the cow paddies are already set up as vectors for possible sources of nutrition. So there is no question that these protohominids would have eaten psilocybin in small amounts. And by small amounts, I mean amounts so small that if you were to eat that much, you would feel nothing. But it's, this dose level has been studied and it causes increased acuity of vision. You can actually give people small amounts of psilocybin and then give them eye tests, and they do better if they're slightly intoxicated than if they are not. The guy who proved this, the Viennese psychologist Roland Fisher, when he described these experiments to me, he said, and so you see, my young friend, here we have a case where the use of drugs actually introduces us to a more true vision of reality than if we have avoided the drug. <clears throat> Scientific proof that the drug is telling you more about reality than if you had refused it. All right, now, what kind of visual acuity is it that is being improved? Well, it turns out it's what's called edge detection. In the grassland environment, where the movement of small animals means dinner, and the movement of large animals means you become dinner, <laughs> a plant which confers increased visual acuity is going to immediately confer an adaptive advantage on those members of the group that let it in. Those members of the group that refuse it out of aesthetic or, or gastronomic reasons will tend to be outbred because the psilocybin using members of the species will be more successful at obtaining food and at surviving to raise their own children to reproductive age, which is the name of the game in, uh, in evolution. So, that's step one of a three-step process that leads to the explosion of consciousness in the, in the hominid brain. Step two, which should have special appeal for this crowd, is that when you take slightly larger doses of psilocybin, not religiously profound doses, but, but doses which you definitely feel, psilocybin is what's called a CNS stimulant, a central nervous system stimulant. What it causes in, in animals is what uh, neuro neurophysiologists call arousal. And in highly sexed animals like primates, arousal means in the male erection. So what, and an animal then which is allowing a, what is essentially a sexual stimulant or an aphrodisiac to enter into the diet, there will be more instances of what anthropologists call successful copulation. And God knows we need that. So if you have more successful copulations, you have more pregnancies. You have another, a second factor, outbreeding uh, the non-psilocybin-using member of the population. Now, something really important here that is my... Well, this whole thing is my theory, but here's the part of it that I like the best. All primates, all primates have what are called dominance hierarchies or male dominance hierarchies. This goes right back clear to lemurs and the old world monkeys, which are much more, or, I mean, yes, the, the new world monkeys, which are more primitive. Uh, all primates have this dominance hierarchy, and what it means is the sharp-fanged, hard-bodied young males, they control 
the women, the children, the elderly, all sexual minorities, everybody is under the thumb of the alpha males. And as we sit here today, though this community may strive to be an exception, as a society, male dominance is an enormous dilemma for us and an enormous distorting factor in our politics and in our lives.